Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to five. Hi, Andrea. How are you feeling now that exams are over? It's fantastic to have finished, isn't it? And to sleep in every morning. What about you? Well, I've been catching up on sleep too, but I've got a lot to do before I leave for England. Perhaps you could give me some advice. I've got a lot of things I can't possibly take back with me, but I don't know what to do with them. Well, it depends on what sort of things they are, and whether you're thinking of giving them away or selling them. Well, almost everything: furniture, the fridge, and other kitchen stuff that I bought from the previous tenant. But the new people have already got what they need, so they're not interested in buying stuff from me. I can't afford to give it away. But I'm not sure how to sell it all. Oh, and there are some clothes and books as well. Why can't you take them? The books are really heavy. It's so expensive if you exceed the airline baggage allowance, and the clothes just won't all fit in my suitcase. It's amazing how much stuff I've accumulated since I've been here. Anyway. I don't think I'll need as many summer clothes in England as I have here in Australia. I see. Well, there are several alternatives. First of all, you could put up notices around the university about the books. You know, on the notice boards in the student union building and in the economics department. Anywhere second and third year students will see them. People are always keen to buy cheap textbooks. Okay, what what should I say on the notices? Just put the titles, authors, and price you want. Your name, of course, and maybe put your phone number on those little tear-off tags. That's a good idea. And what about the furniture? You could try doing the same thing, but usually students are away all summer, so they don't want to buy furniture now. Another place to try. Might be a second-hand shop. Someone from the shop will usually come around and give you a free quote, and then you can decide. But you don't usually get much money for that sort of stuff. You have some time to look at questions six to ten. Another alternative is to put an advertisement in the trading post. Do you know that paper? It comes out every week. Advertising things people want to sell. You have to pay to put the advert in, and then hope people phone. Give them as much information as possible, and if they're interested, invite them to come and have a look. The hard part is agreeing on a price. No, I haven't seen the trading post, but I should have a look at it, and I could advertise the fridge, the microwave, and the furniture. But the kitchen stuff isn't really that good, you know, old cutlery, a few pots and pans, and some plates and things. What shall I do with them? Well, another option is to donate the kitchen things to a charity shop, you know, like the Salvation Army or Saint Vincent de Paul. Why don't you get a second-hand shop to give you a quote first? Yes, I could do that. Find out how much they'll give me, and then decide whether to sell them or give them away. But I've still got the clothes. A charity shop will take them too, as long as they're in good condition. And even though you don't get any money, at least you know that someone who really deserves some help has benefited. That's a good point. I'll advertise the expensive stuff, the furniture, and donate the clothes and kitchen stuff. Let's go and buy a trading post, and you can help me write the advert. Well. Actually, I'm interested in buying the fridge and the microwave, depending on the price, of course. Okay, let's see how good you are at bargaining. Now, listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Excuse me. I want to ask you about the charges for meals. Are they the same as they were last year? No, I'm afraid they're not. We've managed to keep most of them the same, but we've had to increase the charge for breakfast. How much is it now? It's two dollars fifty. It used to be two dollars. I see. What about lunch? It's unchanged. Still three dollars. 
Does dinner still cost three dollars? Yes, it does. We've managed to keep the prices down this year, but the best deal is the three meal plan for forty eight dollars per week. We give you vouchers to present when you come into the cafeteria, and you get twenty one meals for your forty eight dollars. That works out to a little more than two dollars a meal. The two meal plan is also at last year's rates of thirty six dollars per week. We give you vouchers for that too. My sister was in this hostel before me. I'm sure the hours for breakfast used to be longer. Yes, they were. They used to be seven to nine thirty, but to keep our expenses down, we made them seven to nine. Lunch is the way it was, though. Hold on, dinner six to seven thirty. Isn't that a change? Yes, it is. And in fact, the form is wrong. It used to be five thirty to seven thirty, but now it's six to eight p.m. Six to eight p.m. That's good. So, which plan would you like? I'd like to think about it, please. I need to check my lecture schedule. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. Can you tell me how to get to my room, please? Of course, you're in the new wing, which is very freshly painted and pleasant. But I'm afraid you're going to have to go to a couple of other offices before you can have the key. You're in the admissions office now. Leave this office and turn right and go to the end of the hall. The last office is the fees office, where you can pay the balance of your room deposit. They'll give you a receipt. Okay. After you've been to the fees office, come back past admissions. You'll see a very large room at the northwestern corner of the building. You can't miss it. That's the student lounge, and if you go in there, you can meet some of the other students and see who'll have a room near you. That's good. Can I get a cup of coffee there? Yes, there's a vending machine in the corner. Then go to the key room, which is opposite the lift and next to the library. Show them your receipt, and you can pick up your key there. My luggage was sent on ahead. Do you know where I should collect it? The box room is next to the women's toilet. You'll have to get the key from the key room. Thank you. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Good evening, and welcome to this month's Observatory Club lecture. I'm Donald Mackey. And I'm here to talk to you about the solar eclipse in history. A thousand years ago, a total eclipse of the sun was a terrifying religious experience. But these days, an eclipse is more likely to be viewed as a tourist attraction than as a scientific or spiritual event. People will travel literally miles to be in the right place at the right time to get the best view of their eclipse. Well, what exactly causes a solar eclipse? When the world goes dark for a few minutes in the middle of the day, scientifically speaking, the dark spot itself is easy to explain. It is the shadow of the moon streaking across the Earth. This happens every year or two, each time along a different and, to all intents and purposes, a seemingly random piece of the globe. In the past, people often interpreted an eclipse as a danger signal heralding disaster, and in fact, the Chinese were so disturbed by these events that they included among their gods one whose job was to prevent eclipses. But whether or not you are superstitious or take a purely scientific view, our earthly eclipses are special in three ways. Firstly, there can be no doubt. That they are very beautiful. It's as if a deep blue curtain had fallen over the daytime sky as the sun becomes a black void surrounded by the glow of its outer atmosphere. But beyond this, total eclipses possess a second, more compelling beauty in the eyes of us scientists, for they offer a unique opportunity for research. Only during an eclipse can we study the corona. And other dim things that are normally lost in the sun's glare. And thirdly, they are rare. Even though an eclipse of the sun occurs somewhere on Earth every year or two, 
if you sit in your garden and wait, it will take 375 years on average for one to come to you. If the moon were any larger, eclipses would become a monthly bore. If it were smaller, they simply would not be possible. The ancient Babylonian priests, who spent a fair bit of time staring at the sky, had already noted that there was an 18-year pattern in their recurrence, but they didn't have the mathematics to predict an eclipse accurately. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. It was Edmund Haley, the English astronomer, who knew his maths well enough to predict the return of the comet, which incidentally bears his name, and in 1715 he became the first person to make an accurate eclipse prediction. This brought eclipses firmly into the scientific domain, and they have since allowed a number of important scientific discoveries to be made. For instance, in the eclipse of 1868, two scientists, Janssen and Lockyer, were observing the sun's atmosphere, and it was these observations that ultimately led to the discovery of a new element. They named the element helium after the Greek god of the sun. This was a major find, because helium turned out to be the most common element in the universe after hydrogen. Another great triumph involved mercury. I'll just put that up on the board for you now. See, there's Mercury, the planet closest to the Sun, then there's Venus, Earth, etc. For centuries, scientists had been unable to understand why Mercury appeared to rotate faster than it should. Some astronomers suggested that there might be an undiscovered planet causing this unusual orbit, and even gave it the name Vulcan. During the eclipse of 1878, an American astronomer, James Watson, thought he had spotted this so-called lost planet. But alas for him, he was later obliged to admit that he had been wrong about Vulcan and withdrew his claim. Then Albert Einstein came on the scene. Einstein suggested that rather than being wrong about the number of planets, Astronomers were actually wrong about gravity. Einstein's theory of relativity, for which he is so famous, disagreed with Newton's law of gravity in just the right way to explain Mercury's odd orbit. He also realized that a definitive test would be possible during the total eclipse of 1919, and this is indeed when his theory was finally proved correct. So, there you have several examples of how eclipses have helped to increase our understanding of the universe. And now, let's move on the social. Listen and complete questions 31 to 40. Here is the President of the International Committee. Mr. Samaranch's speech at the opening ceremony of the 26th Olympic Games, I'll read it for you. On behalf of the International Olympic Committee, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Games of the 26th Olympiad, Sydney 2000. The goal of the Olympic movement is to contribute to building a peaceful and better world by educating youth through sport practice without discrimination of any kind and in the Olympic spirit. In the spirit, nations and youth of the world come together every four years to celebrate the world's largest sporting festival. SOCOG has organized these sporting competitions in consultation with the international federations, responsible for each sport. This is through nomination of technical officials, specification of technical requirements, and the cooperation with IOC and SOCOG on venue and other preparations. We thank each international federation for their vital efforts in the preparation of these Millennium Games. The Sydney 2000 Olympic Games is also the centenary of women's participation. With a record number of events and disciplines for women at the Games, the Olympic movement continues to recognize and support the vital role of women in sport. 
As we embark on a new millennium, it is the Olympic Games that will continue to unite the world and celebrate humanity.